Hello, welcome to Introduction to Psychology, Psych 105 at the Pennsylvania Institute of Technology. So we're going to start off by discussing what do psychologists actually study? Well, they study psychology, which is the scientific study of behaviors and mental processes. They also study behaviors, which refers to observable actions or responses in both humans and animals, and mental processes, not directly observable, but these refer to a wide range of complex mental processes, such as thinking, imagining, studying, and dreaming. The goals of psychology are to describe the different ways that organisms behave, explain the cause of behavior, predict how organisms will behave in certain situations, and number four, control an organism's behavior. Note, psychologies, psychologists are not trying to create zombies who will do their bidding. Rather, they are trying to understand the factors that influence behavior and pl apply this knowledge for the public good. So when we say control an organism's behavior, we're not trying to get them to do anything nefarious. Rather, we're trying to understand why they may be a serial killer or why they may feel a compulsion to light fires or beat their spouse and try and control those impulses that are negative to society. So we're going to start off by talking about psychological theories and what are they. Theories in and of themselves suggest reasons for relationships between events. For example, you may feel threatened by someone which would increase your anxiety. Theories allow psychologists to develop explanations and predictions. A good psychological theory allows us to predict behavior. So that concept of a theory is that idea that allows us to say, if X, then Y. So it allows us to predict the behaviors. So we're going to start off with clinical psychology because this is the one that most of us imagine when we think of psychology. Clinical psychologists help people with psychological disorders adjust to the demands of life. They evaluate issues such as anxiety and depression through interviews and psychological testing. And then they help clients resolve problems and change self-defeating behaviors. There are a whole ton of psychological specializations, and I'm going to just mention about a dozen or so of them so that you understand how wide the field is. This is not just clinical psychologists and that's all. There's social psychology, which involves the study of social interactions, stereotypes, prejudices, attitudes, conformity, group behaviors, and aggression in social situations. Personality psychology involves the study of personality development, personality change, assessment, and abnormal behaviors. They specifically research issues such as anxiety, aggression, and gender roles. Three, developmental psychology examines the changes in moral, social, emotional, and cognitive development throughout a person's entire life. So if you've taken a course like Human Growth and Development or Lifespan Psychology, that's what developmental psychologists work with. Experimental psychology includes areas of sensation, perception, learning, human performance, motivation, and emotion. For example, they may study how music impacts our ability to learn. There is a very controversial research study about whether or not listening to music by Mozart will improve our math scores. There are equal number of research studies that say it is effective and an equal number that says it's not effective. Biological psychology or psychobiology, which involves research on the physical and chemical changes 
that occur during stress, learning, and emotions, as well as how our genetic makeup, brain, and nervous system interact with our environments and influence our behaviors. Cognitive psychology, which involves how we process, store, and retrieve information, and how cognitive processes influence our behaviors. Number seven, psychometrics focuses on the measurements of people's abilities, skills, intelligence, personality, and abnormal behaviors. So if you've ever taken an IQ exam, that's a psychometric. Counseling psychologists are like clinical psychologists, but they usually deal with clients who have less serious issues, such as needing vocational advice to make good decisions. You know, this is that life coaching idea. School psychologists are employed at schools to identify and assist students who have problems that interfere with their academic progress. Number 10, educational psychologists focus on planning and instructional methods for school systems. They research issues about how psychological issues interfere and affect learning. Issues such as motivation and sociocultural factors are researched. Environmental psychologists study the way that people and the, com and the environment influence one another. For example, it's really hard to concentrate and learn in very hot weather. So environmental psychologists also study how to encourage people to recycle and other nature-based issues. Forensic psychologists work with the legal system, helping to determine if a defendant is legally responsible for their crimes. They may also treat psychologically ill offenders, consult with attorneys on jury selection, and evaluate eyewitness testimony. Sports psychologists help athletes concentrate on their performance and not on external factors, such as the booing crowd, especially in Philadelphia. They often use positive visualization as part of their process. Human factors psychologists help engineers make technology more user-friendly and intuitive to people. Think of your car's dashboard, think of your smartphone and how you know 10 years ago we didn't even have iPhones or Androids we had the flip phone we had our clamshell and now everybody has a smartphone and we didn't need somebody to sit down and really show us how to use it it was intuitive it was something that we just figured out consumer psychologists study the behavior of shoppers to try and predict and influence their behavior for example Candy at the checkout counter creates impulse purchases, especially if you have children with you. Now they put little toys at the checkout counter. Um, you know, the most expensive cereals are at eye level. These are all very intentionally done, determined, and studied by these consumer psychologists. Finally, industrial psychologists focus on the relationships between people and work. You know, there's all this um, press about how at Google they have pool tables and napping areas and full restaurants and all this stuff. Well, the key there is they don't want you to go home. They want you to stay at work and continue to work and put in 12, 14, 16 hour days and make it such a nice place to be. You don't want to go home and sit in your house because it's more fun to be at work. So we're also going to now discuss the early theories of psychology and there's five we're going to be talking about structuralism, functionalism, behaviorism, gestalt, and psychoanalysis. Structuralism was developed by Wilhelm Wundt and he was in 1832 to 1920. Structuralists believe the mind functions by combining objective and subjective elements of experience. Objective elements are things we can see, taste, touch, so if you can pick it up, it's objective. Subjective elements are feelings, emotional responses, mental images such as dreams or memories. So our mind is a combination of these two ideas according to Wundt. So his famous quote is, our mind is so fortunately equipped that it brings us the most important basis for our thoughts, 
without our having the least knowledge of this work of elaboration. Only the results of it becomes unconscious. So we create thought unconsciously, in a sense. Then we move on to functionalism, which was developed by William James, 1842 to 1910. Um, he is also well known as the brother of Henry James, who was one of the great early American writers of this era. Functionalists look at how experience helps us function more adaptively in our environments. So for example, we develop skills and habits that assist us to be safe and successful in our lives. For example, if we live in a city, we are more likely to lock our doors. And one of his famous quotes is, the greatest weapon against stress is our ability to choose one thought over another. So in that thought process, we can engage in a defense mechanism called denial because we choose not to worry about the fact that we haven't paid our mortgage or our car note. Instead, we'll focus on something else. And in his mind or in his theory, you know, this helps us manage our stress. Then we have behaviorism. Um, it was originally developed by John Brodus Watson, 1878 to 1958. His goal was to turn psychology into a pure science, which focuses on observable measurable events such as blood pressure, heart rate, and brain waves. B.F. Skinner picked up the football, so to speak, in his era, 1904 to 1990, and expanded behaviorism by experimenting with reinforcement providing a positive outcome for specific behaviors. He trained rats to climb ladders and push toys by rewarding them with food. So there are a lot of things to this day that we apply using behaviorism. Think about grades. You know, we give you an A and you feel really good about yourself because that's a positive outcome. Somebody who does not do well in a class and may get a D or an F, they don't feel good about themselves and their reinforcement is I'm not good enough. Whereas if you look at it from the perspective of they didn't do the work or they did not submit enough work, that's different. So people oftentimes take the reinforcement and misunderstand how it's being used. Um, we will use it with our kids. You know, if you use the potty, I will get you big girl panties. If you um, use the potty, I will make sure you get to go to Sesame Street place, Sesame Place. There's all kinds of things we barter and bargain with our kids over. And it's the idea of giving them rewards for good behavior. Then we have the Gestalt, which was developed in the 1920s by three German psychologists, Max Wertheimer, Kurt Kafka, and Wolfgang Kohler. They were forced to leave Germany and come to the United States in the 1930s because of the Nazis. And um, if you haven't figured it out, those three psychologists were all Jewish people. The Gestalt psychologists believe that mental experience was dependent not on a simple combination of elements, but on the organization and patterning of experience and of one's perceptions. So it is the totality of one's experience. You cannot look at something just by itself. So other elements of Gestalt include proximity, which is objects that are closer together are more likely to be seen as belonging together. Similarity. Similar elements are perceived as belonging together. Continuity. Sensations that seem to create a continuous form are perceived as belonging together. Closure. The tendency that makes people mentally fill in missing areas to create a whole. Texture. The tendency to group together items with a similar texture. Simplicity. Grouping items together in the simplest way possible. And common fate, grouping together sets of objects moving in the same direction at the same speed. So again, the idea of Gestalt is not to look at it as an individual piece, but to look at the entirety of the um, experience to analyze 
what's going on. And then we get to psychoanal psychoanalysis, which was developed by Sigmund Freud, 1856 to 1939. Psychoanalysis aims to help patients gain insight into their conflicts and to find socially acceptable ways of expressing wishes and gratifying needs. Freud believes that much of our lives is governed by unconscious ideas and impulses that originated in childhood conflicts. And one of his famous quotes, unexpressed emotions will never die. They are buried alive and will come forth later in uglier ways. So, and most of us can say, yep, that usually does happen. So we're going to take a few minutes and talk about Sigmund Freud because he is perhaps the most famous of the founders of the field of psychology. And a few of his theories are fundamental to understanding where the field started. Um, his structures of the mind, he believed, were empowered by the libido. And that's Freud's term for the psychic energy, which is similar to the physical energy that fuels bodily functions. Now, libido is also known as our sex drive in modern um, terminology. Uh, but what he saw, it, Freud really saw it as this life force that lived inside of us. He divided the brain into three pieces. One, the id. And this structure is present at birth. So as soon as we come out of mom, it's there and contains all our basic instincts, such as our need for food, water, dry clothes, and love or nurturing. It strives only to secure pleasure. Your id wants whatever feels good at the time with no consideration for the reality of the situation. It wants what it wants and it doesn't care about anything else. It's like a drunk friend who wants that chili cheese dog and you're like nope you're not vomiting it up in my car and they're like I don't care but you gotta like calm them down and that is the ego the rational part of our personality this is the part of our brain that does the planning and keeps us in touch with reality it starts to develop after we're born theoretically the stronger the ego becomes the more successful the person becomes because this is our rational planning part this is the part of our brain that says okay if I want to do this I have to follow these steps then we have our superego which is our conscience or our moral compass and it dictates what is wrong or right and it begins to develop during our infancy and that's 0 to 18 months give or take so if you want to think about it from the perspective of the old uh, uh, devil angel on your shoulder, the id is the devil on your shoulder, the superego is the angel on your shoulder, and your brain is the ego. It's the rational part. So there's this never-ending battle between the id and the superego while the ego tries to compromise. So, for example, if the id says, I want money and I want lots of it, and the ego says, well, we can rob a bank. I can plan to rob a bank. And here are all the plans. And the superego whispers going, you know, that's really not a good idea. I think you should go to college, get a good job, make a lot of money that way. So it's this constant idea of these three forces at work against each other. Now, remember, these are theories. These are not facts. It's a theoretical construct that Freud created. He also developed his psychosexual theory of personality development and it's in five stages and again this is one of those things where you can't get out of a psychology class without knowing these things we start off with number one the oral stage you start from zero to about 18 months or a year and a half the mouth is the pleasure center the purpose is to achieve the appropriate amount of sucking eating biting and talking too much or too little gratification can result in an oral fixation or oral personality which is evidenced by a preoccupation with oral activities. This type of personality may have a stronger tendency 
to smoke, drink, alcohol, overeat, or bite his or her nails. Personality-wise, these individuals may become overly dependent upon others, be gullible, and perpetual followers. On the other hand, they may also fight these urges and develop pessimism and aggression towards others. Then we move on to the anal stage, which is age one and a half to about three years old, and this is when the anus becomes the pleasure center. And the purpose is to achieve successful toilet training. But in terms of personality, the after effects of an anal fixation during this stage can result in an obsession with cleanliness, perfection, and control, which we now know as anal retentive. On the opposite end of the spectrum, they can become messy and disorganized, anal expulsive. And a lot of this depends on how the parents manage that toilet training experience. If the parents are calm, you know, then the child will become toilet trained and it's no big deal. But if the parents act out and scream and yell and punish the child and cry, that's when the each end of the spectrum could become a possibility and the child is reacting because they don't understand that they're not doing the right thing because they've just spent the last year and a half, two years in a diaper. And also keep in mind that that time between the parent or the caretaker and the child, when they're doing the diaper changing, the parent is paying 100% attention to their child. They're not watching TV, they're not playing with their phone, they're not doing anything else. So the child craves that attention and to take that away from them and make them sit on this cold porcelain thing that kind of looks like a monster's mouth can be very scary for the child. Moving on to the phallic stage, which is around ages three to five. The pleasure zone switches to the genitals. Freud believed, and again, we're not talking facts, we're talking theory. Freud believed that during this stage, children develop an unconscious sexual desire for their opposite gender parent. Because of this, they become rivals with their same gender parent and sees them as competition for the opposite gender's affection. During this time, children also develop a fear that their same gender parent will punish them for these feelings. For fathers and daughters, this is known as the electric complex. And for mothers and sons, this is known as the Oedipal complex. The resolution of the conflict is caused by this desire, caused by this desire is the goal. So you want to resolve this conflict. According to Freud, out of fear of punishment and due to the strong competition of their same gender parent, children eventually decide to identify with their same gender parent rather than fight them. By identifying with his father, the boy develops masculine characteristics and identifies himself as a male and represses his sexual feelings towards his mother. For girls, they develop feminine characteristics and they repress their sexual feelings towards their fathers. Now, when we talk about sexual feelings, we're talking about this in an age-appropriate way. They do not have the same kind of sexual feelings that a 17-year-old boy or girl may have. They are thinking in a more disnified way. You know, we're going to get married and lo live happily ever after. They're not actually thinking of the actual sexual act. However, a fixation at this stage could result in sexual deviancies, both overindulging and avoidance, and a weak or confused sexual identity according to psychoanalysts. There's also the thought process that um, fixation at this point will have a woman pursue men who are significantly older than her, or a man pursue women who are significantly older than he is. Then you move into the latency stage, which is about 5 to 12 years old, and I call this the cootie stage. Sexual desire is dormant. Children treat the opposite gender playmates with disdain and prefer to engage with their same gender peers. This is when boys play with boys and girls play with girls, and never the two shall meet. 
Then we finish with the genital stage, and this is 12 years to about 18 or 19, and this is when a surge of hormones brings about a return to the phallic stage. The fixation is no longer on the parent, but on the individuals of their own age. The genitals are once again the focus of pleasure. So, you know, puberty is what occurs around age 12, and that's when the hormones kick in, and that's when, you know, boys and girls start to show interest in one another. So moving on, let's talk about the contemporary psychological approaches. We have the biological approach, the cognitive approach, behavioral approach, psychodynamic approach, humanistic existential approach, and the socio-cultural approach. Biological approach focuses on the relationship between our genes, hormones, and nervous system, and how they interact with our environments to influence learning, personality, memory, motivation, emotions, and coping techniques. So for example, adaptive behaviors such as having a strong immune system mean certain people survive through pandemics. Also, autism tends to run in families, which is supported by the findings in identical twins. So if one twin has autism, there is a high 90% chance the other twin will exhibit signs for autistic behavior. So they look at chemical activity, genetic influences, and hormonal influences. Cognitive approach examines how we process, store, and use information, and how this information influences what we attend to, perceive, learn, remember, believe, and feel. There's a subset called cognitive neuroscience, which involves taking pictures and identifying the structures and functions of the living brain during the performance of a wide variety of mental or cognitive processes, such as thinking, planning, naming, and recognizing objects. And they're using this a lot on people who have exhibited truly violent um, activity to see if there are issues with their brain um, in terms of how different parts of it light up under a functional MRI versus how somebody who doesn't engage in these behaviors, um, how their brains react. Then we have the behavioral approach, which studies how organisms learn new behaviors or modify existing ones, depending on whether events in their environments reward or punish these behaviors. Some behaviorists, such as M. Albert Bandura, disagree with strict behaviorism and formulated a theory that includes mental or cognitive processes in addition to observable behaviors, called the social cognition approach, in which behaviors are influenced not only by environmental events and reinforcers, but also by observation, imitation, and thought processes. We have the psychodynamic approach, which is based on the Freudian ideas of childhood experiences that greatly influence the development of later personality traits. So Freud, as much as some of his stuff sounds kind of crazy, is still really important today. It stresses the influence of unconscious fears, desires, and motivations on thoughts, behaviors, and the development of personality traits and the psychological problems later in life. Moving on, we have uh, the humanistic or existential approach. Uh, those of you who have heard of Abraham Ma Maslow will recognize the triangle on the right. And it's based on the idea of humanism, which emphasizes that each individual has a great freedom in directing his or her future, a large capacity for personal growth, a considerable amount of intrinsic worth, and enormous potential for self-fulfillment. Consciousness, our sense of being in the world, is the force that unifies our personalities. So um, Oprah Winfrey is a big believer in the Maslow humanistic approach, and uh, when she still had her TV show, she really um, provided a, a huge thrust in society for this belief. Existentialism views people as free to choose as being responsible for choosing ethical conduct, meaning that we don't necessarily need to believe in a god, 
but that we should be good for good's sake. Finally, we have the socio-cultural approach, which examines the influence of cultural and ethnic similarities and differences on psychological and social functioning of a culture's members. For example, there are differences in how countries diagnose autism. In the United States, symptoms were described before World War II in the 1930s. Um, it was actually initially discovered or described in Germany and those doctors again <laughs> had to come to the United States um, initially thought to be caused by environmental factors specifically a distant or cold mother beginning in the 1960s researchers began searching for biological problems and the diagnoses begins at ages two or three and early interventions have proven to be very effective in moderating some of the social and behavioral issues caused by autism. If you are interested in autism, there is a phenomenal book called Neurotribes by Steve Silberman that came out a few years ago that's won all kinds of awards that goes into the history of autism and uh, specifically looks at why uh, autism has become such a hot button issue in uh, terms of the medical treatment in this country. Now, in China, on the other hand, autism was not even a recognized condition until 1987. Many Chinese parents were unaware of an infant's developmental stages when the social and verbal skills first developed because, you know, up until the 90s, China, you know, was really a third world country before they really got into manufacturing and, um, becoming a world producer and the thought process for the longest time was that infants would grow out of their difficulties and would get over it. So in terms of where people are today is they are just beginning to understand the impact of what autism can do whereas in the United States especially in the states that have um, you know really done early intervention you know kids with autism have been made streamlined mainlined and put in situations where they can achieve and really successfully uh, manage their condition so that's it for this presentation if you have any questions feel free to text or email me if you're not in my class please leave a comment and I will get back to you as soon as I can Otherwise, have a fabulous day. Thank you.